a concern I often hear, right, is that AI and all this stuff's going to take jobs away. Is that what you're seeing or are you just seeing it empowering engineers? The way I would answer that is there's agent augmented and then agent only. Okay. We're in the in the former. I don't see a time where it would be agent only. Okay. I see it more around the agent augmented. I, I've heard this from many people. They phone Cisco Tech as an example. They get bounced around. You have to repeat themselves. And then perhaps a, a, a person working in the US ends for the day and then they get pushed to another call center perhaps and then they have to explain the whole story again. There must be a better way than doing it that way, right? There is. And this is what we talked about today is, you know, think about it in our own personal lives, right? We call somebody and, you know, you get just get handed off to somebody else and you're explaining the whole thing over and over yep. again. Yeah. Here we're talking about live networks of exactly. our customers who pay us a lot of money in terms of support. The team worked on a an innovation called intelligent call routing. Nice. And the idea is that it gets handed off to the right expert the first time around. Everyone, David Bumble back with a very, very special guest. Liz, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. I think this is my first time here. It is. I'm excited. It's great to have you on the show because you work with a really special group of people. But before we get there, 20,000 people, I think, is is the amount of people that you manage. Correct. So tell us about what you do. So what the team does, I mean, we're called customer experience, and it covers everything from professional services. So think about plan, design, implement. You know, you want a new ACI architecture, a new data center. You want to deploy SD-WAN. That's the team that does that in terms of working with our partners on plan, design, and implement. I have a customer success teams that helps our customers adopt the technology. Yeah. You know, we want them to, when you buy something, adopt it so they love it really yeah. quick. I have a team that does renewals for all of our software and services, and then a customer support team as well. And I believe TAC is, is, is one of the teams that you manage? Correct. So I think a lot of people watching may know what TAC is or may not know. So explain to us what TAC does. Because I mean, I've, I know TAC, obviously, Him. but uh, what, what does TAC do? Think about it. It's like you have an issue. That, those are the folks that you call. Uh, that's customer support. Yeah. You know, so everything from across every technology, across every product portfolio, and sometimes customers have been cause, call us for issues that are not even Cisco issues, and we help them in terms of reaching out to our partners as well, sometimes reaching out to some of our competing vendors as well. It really is around helping our customers run their operations in a much more resilient way. The big talk at the moment is AI and agentic AI. Have you seen that impact the team that you're leading? Have you seen that change the interactions with customers? Yeah, so I'll start with the customer part of it. You know, a lot of what we have done so far, we've used, like I would say, predictive AI and ML and automation for quite some time. It hasn't been new for us, but it's more around we built automation and uh, helped our customers with efficiency of it. But with generative AI and agentic coming, the speed at which our customers need to move yeah. are way faster than what it was before. And so the traditional ways of how we help our customers design something, how we help our customers optimize and manage their environments, break fix and, you know, kind of reactive is not going to help. And so this is where the opportunity is like, how do we change the way we interact with our customers, the way we deliver services to them? We've got to rethink this for reactive might be a thing of the past, yeah. maybe, you know, at times, but really the table stakes in the future is going to be where you can predict something. You can anticipate things. Our customers are looking at us and going, you have a lot of my data. You have knowledge in my environment. The technology is here to allow you to help me optimize, like alert me to things, like be that crystal ball yep. that actually tells me, you know, it's, you know, there's a security advisory here. You haven't implemented it. Here's the potential issues, but then also do it in a hyper-personalized way. Don't just give me vanilla, like, oh, by the way, you know, it's a yes or a no. Am I compliant or not? Get down to specifics on things because you can bring in context of my in environment. So for us, I would say is we don't lack use cases because these are problems that our customers have been dealing around. You know, yes, we've improved the amount of manual work our customers do, but we want to get to a point where they don't have to do that manual work anymore. And so it's it's solving what I would say is boring operational problems that we've been circling around for years. I mean, think about like config issues. We've been around to where config issues have been 
around forever. 25% of our TAC cases that we get are still config issues. Is that right? And so this high. technology wow. gives us the opportunity to go from config chaos to config confidence, like almost eliminate it. So are you using agents to check configs or what's actually happening? So a couple of things that we're doing is around in the planning and design and implement phases, we are using things like digitizing a customer intent. Okay. So we know what was their design principles in mind and integrating config as part of the testing pipeline. So even before it's implemented, we are now automating and it can be replicated, whether it's, you know, take a new branch, it's one branch, 10 branch, 100 branches or 1,000 branches. We're automating kind of the configuration and deployment across all of this tied to that original customer intent. Just an example yeah. of that. The other one is using, you know, for example, how do we help customers with their infrastructure assessments? Here, we're taking a much more proactive approach where an agent behind the scenes is assessing things around configuration issues, configuration risk, for example, and using context of that customer's environment and best practices, alerting a customer to potential config issues that could lead to performance bottlenecks that could potentially lead to security issues. These are things that customers want in terms of that proactive approach. And when issues do happen, what we're doing with with agents is helping our own teams with like, what's the next best action to take to be able to resolve those issues as fast as possible. But before where you, we used to do it with general best, best practices, now we're actually bringing in context of that customer environment because we know their account history. We know what products that they've deployed in, out there. We know kind of what are the hardening guides that are out there. Yeah. An agent can pour through all of that and provide the human with that next best action that's personalized to that customer. Is it? That's exciting. It is. I mean, it's amazing. A concern I often hear, right, is that AI and all the stuff's going to take jobs away. Is that what you're seeing or are you just seeing it empowering engineers? The way I would answer that is there's agent augmented and then agent only. Okay. We're in the in the former. I don't see a time where it would be agent only. Okay. I see it more around the agent augmented. So we are breaking up every workflow across all of our functions, whether it's professional services or the customer success team or support for that matter and saying, where are those repeatable you know, kind of repetitive task, whether it's around data gathering or analytics, that an agent can help do autonomously. And then where does it make sense to hand off to a human? Yeah. So for us, the human is always there. And what we're doing with agents right now is around augmentation because there's so much cognitive load on our teams. And we see this with our partner teams. We see with this with our customer teams as well, because in some ways we've kind of accepted that, well, you know, if I have to go to 50 different places to gather the data and really do analytics out of that to really get some insights, and then I may get context that is within silos and I've got to stitch all of this together. Well, that's just the way my job is yeah. today. Well, don't have to do that anymore. This is what an agent can do, then hand off to a human to where the human is spending more time understanding that customer much better. And then we go back to training our agentic systems in a way. It's getting better. It's learning. It's predicting. It's acting. It's taking in all this feedback loops that's coming in from our humans as well, along with all the account histories, to the point that I would like my teams to know each customer like they are our only customer. Yeah. And think about it. We have 900,000 plus customers. Yeah, exactly. And so to me, that is that the technology makes that possible. I, I've heard this from many people. They phone Cisco Tech as an example. They get bounced around. You have to repeat themselves. And then perhaps a, a, a person working in the US ends for the day and then they get pushed to another call center perhaps and then they have to explain the whole story again. There must be a better way than doing it that way, right? There is. And this is what we talked about today is, 
you know, think about it in our own personal lives, right? We call somebody and, you know, you get just get handed off to somebody else and you're explaining the whole thing over and over yep. again. Yep. Here we're talking about live networks of exactly. our customers who pay us a lot of money in terms of support. The team worked on a an innovation called intelligent call routing. Nice. And the idea is that it gets handed off to the right expert the first time around. So as of this last month, I think 77% of our 1.5 million support cases are actually handed off to the right expert every single time. Wow. And our goal is to obviously hit 100%. But this is over a short period of time in terms of we just launched intelligent call routing about six months ago. So for customers, what we're seeing and we already are getting the feedback is no handoffs, yeah. no bouncing back and forth. Yeah. Again, it's more around... You know, we're enabling, in addition to intelligent call routing, we're enabling our engineers with bringing in that context because an agentic system can handle that mass amount of data, update it, learn it, predict, provide the next action more than any human can. So this is the way we're augmenting our teams as well. And what it means for us is that more cases get solved in a day. Today, about 40% of our high severity cases are solved in a day. That's cool. Yeah. My goal was 100%, but the team said, you know, there are some customers who actually call in and say, keep my case open. I said, okay, then let's do 75%. But my goal is to be able to get closer to that 100. So the intelligent call routing, is that done by an agent or how is that done? It is done by an agent, absolutely. And that it's something that we internally built as well. I mean, at Cisco Live just a few months ago, I was hearing, okay, the future is going to be changed by agents but it sounds like it's already here. It's already being implemented. It's already here. It's being implemented. And one of our customers asked today, uh, one of our partners said, hey, what about, you know, attack agent? Because we have a support agent today, both customer facing and help, and augmenting the work of our engineers. And he said, I want my agents to interact with your attack agent. And I said, by the way, what's wow. on the roadmap right now is, is support for MCP, support for agent to agent communication, which means... When a partner is working or a customer is working in a multi-vendor environment and they, they have an issue, they can stand up a war room. I mean, think about war rooms, right? We always stood that up. A customer had an issue, pretty critical, network down. You have a bunch of humans around the table. The future is where there's a bunch of agents around the table. And agents trigger kind of, you know, certain things like assessments, for example. It's not a human that actually, you know, triggers like a security assessment or a security assessment is done. And it's actually that triggers probably another action that an agent has to do. And I think that's the future that we are just thinking of where, you know, things like war rooms, which was where I've grown up in, is now manned by multiple agents, different personas versus humans. And then you know, the ultimate actions and recommendations do go to a human because I do want to emphasize that human in the loop yeah. is so important because the agents that, that we're building need to be deterministic because we're talking about live networks. Yet the technology that we're building on is probabilistic. So we're putting those guardrails in, whether it is using things like RAG, whether it is using things like, and, and human in the loop, to make sure that the outcome and the output we're providing is accurate, it's transparent, it's verifiable. In the real world, which you're working in, not YouTube world, you know, agents sound like, okay, it's just easy, just spin up an MCP server and there you go. But there must be challenges implementing this stuff, especially at scale. Yeah, so I can think of two things that come up each and every time. One is data. I mean, when you when you know you probably heard me say today is like, hey, we've got forty plus years of data. So we have structured data, we have unstructured data, we have static data, we have dynamic data, we have batch data, we even have melt data. So metric events, logs, and traces. Fantastic, right? Because agents need data, but they need accurate data. They need high quality data. And they need like a structured semantic model. Well, our data is doesn't in the real world is not that way at exactly all. Exactly right. I mean, you're nodding your head. Yep. It sits in different systems. It's fragmented. It's you know, there's data that's missing. It's it's duplicative. So frustratingly, the long pole in the tent is the amount of time that we spend just even around data preparation and data cleansing and uh, you know, kind of normalization of the data. And I think that's taken, it surprised me at the amount of time that it's taken, but it's worth. The other one is testing agents is hard to do because they vary with the, with each run, which is 
different from how we've done traditional yeah, you know, software and ones, development. Yeah, yeah. So those test harnesses need to have an underlying framework of you know observability, traceability, for example. So do, those are the two things that I can think of. On the cultural side, what we see is there's an excitement around what agents can do for us because we've articulated the use case and very defined metrics around it. But the mental model shift still hasn't completely yeah. happened because our teams are used to getting tools where it's completely developed and then it's handed off. They had their mental model is very much, hey, you build it, you you build, you test, you deploy, and that's when I use. Yeah. But we're trying to explain to the majority of our teams who are sitting a little bit on the fence to say, by the way, you as a user were super helpful in us defining where agents are useful in the workflow, but you as a user are a key part of our development stack. It's not the underlying large language model and the agent framework and all the tools. You're part of that development stack. So when we put an agent out there, it's only 60% or so of the way done for us to get it to that 100% to where it's accurate. You can actually scale to like hundreds and thousands of users. We need you to use it and we need your help to actually refine it. And that mental model shift is hard for people to get there because they're like, well, if it's not completely there, there are these five other tools I can use. Yes, it's going to take me longer, but I'm just going to go around it. The second thing is there's that fear. Yeah. Every single time I talk to our teams and say, this is augmenting your work. I don't see yet where agents will replace the work that you do. In customer experience, the human is at the center of things that we do. The empathy, the emotional intelligence, I haven't seen technology being able to replicate uh. that. But I can say it many times over, the fear is still there. And what we're doing is helping people use the technology. Because when you use it, the fear tends to go down a bit more and you demonize it less as well. So those are some of the challenges, both technically and culturally, that we're facing right now. I've got to ask you this question because it's another hot topic, quantum computing, what's happening? So I would say it's nearer than we talked about it a year or so ago. But I also think practically looking at it, most of our customers' environment will be a hybrid of traditional you know, and quantum networks as well. What we're thinking about in services is how do we help our customers assess if they're ready for yeah. this, especially for this post-quantum cryptography world. That is a big one. So doing those assessments are one of the new service capabilities that we're building right now. So you are helping customers get ready for this because it sounds like it's coming quicker than a lot of people anticipated. Absolutely. And um, especially around cryptography, going from where they are today to a PQC world, one is the assessment, highlighting to them what changes are needed, and then helping them through that as well. Does Cisco have solutions that customers can deploy? to help them solve this issue. That is what we're build, working on building today. And we can do that because we're spending less time on some of the manual work. So we're thinking about what are the new things we can help customers with. I always like to ask this question. If you were talking to your younger self or someone who is new to the industry, perhaps you know they're looking at a career path, what's your advice? So I would say is, you know, think about like the opportunities and the traditional way of thinking is gone. And think about, you know, what, What's your passion about and how you can actually solve problems that we've never solved before? Yeah. So there's an opportunity beyond when I started. On the other hand, I would also say is that be open to multiple experiences and learning needs to be continuous because sometimes as you come through your career, it's almost like as you take on increasing responsibilities, that learning kind of gets you know to, to the side a little bit. What we're doing is we're training our teams on AI for everyone. Everyone foundational needs to have it. And then by job roles, we have that as well. I take a class on the weekends. I read, I listen to podcasts. I think for me, that continuous learning bit is even more important today than it ever was. And so if I would go back, I'd say, think about continuous learning and think about learning from different ways because yeah. it's not just the traditional form of learning. So that curiosity, that ambition, that drive, that resilience, that grit, and the continuous learning, I would say is that's that's what, you know, I would tell my younger self. I love that. Never stop learning, right? 
Correct. Liz, unfortunately, as always, I run out of time. I wish I could keep you for a lot longer. Thanks so much for sharing and for also inspiring the next generation. Thank you. This went really went by really fast. I hope to be back again. I hope so. 